Our next webinar will cover the grassroots education work of the Indochina Mobile Education Project. It will take place on Tuesday, July 23rd at 7 p.m. A commercial notice. No one is paid at VPCC, but there are inescapable costs for Zoom, YouTube, and promotion. The donation link is on the chat and, you, and will be provided when I send the YouTube link. So um, we now have 123 people already on. I'm gonna turn it over to Doug Hostetter who is moderating the panel, Doug. Doug, I should say is himself a former Mennonite Central Committee volunteer in Vietnam. Doug, go ahead. Thanks so much. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, I am also on the Vietnam uh, Peace Commemoration Committee board, and uh, it's been a privilege to reach out and try to find uh, a few of the many volunteers who were in Vietnam uh, during the Vietnam War to talk about their experiences in, in Vietnam, how it shaped them, changed their opinions, and then how they took that information and came back to the United States. When the Americans went to war in Vietnam, most Americans had no knowledge of where Vietnam was, much less its history, its people, its cuisine, its art, or its literature. Many of the male humanitarian volunteers were doing alternative service to the military. Speaking personally, I knew that it was morally wrong to kill another human being. But by and large, I accepted the US government's understanding that the US military was there to protect the Vietnamese from the Chinese and Russian communists. It did, it did not take long living in a small village in central Vietnam to realize that not only was it wrong to kill people, but that US was actually on the wrong side. Uh, when I was in Tham Ki, the most critical work that I did was to organize a literacy program using Vietnamese high school students as the volunteer teachers to teach six and seven year old Vietnamese in refugee camps how to read and write their own language. It was an amazing program. It started in the refugee camps and eventually uh, moved out to villages around Tham Ki, some on the Saigon side, some on the other side. But by the time I left, there were more than 90 high school students teaching 5,000 Vietnamese children how to read and write their own language. After returning to the US for graduate school in 1969, I, became, I threw myself into the anti-war movement and actually was asked to join uh, the uh, US National Student Association delegation going to Saigon and Hanoi in November of De and December of, of 1970 to negotiate the People's Peace Treaty and that was because I'd be, I was fluent in Vietnamese. Many of us brought back uh, language, literature, art, and cuisine from Vietnam to introduce the American people uh, to the people of Vietnam. We knew that if the Americans knew the Vietnamese that we knew, they would never support that war. So you'll hear from five or six um, Americans who spent time in Vietnam. We'll start with Anne Wright uh, Parsons, uh, she joined the International Voluntary Service the summer of 1962 after graduating from Grinnell College in Iowa. Anne and a colleague were teachers in the two main public schools in Hue, Anne in the Dom Khan Girls School and her colleague Jay in the Cook Hop, where many graduates later became political leaders, such as Ngo uh, Dinh um, Anne and Jay became active in the anti-Zim activities as the demonstrations grew in way and friends and teachers were thrown into prison. Anne. Well, um, you took my first paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> um, we uh, knew from IVS literature that we were supposed to remain neutral. I came to Vietnam because I looked on the map and it was close to China and I had had an interest in China since junior high. So I was interested in the culture um, and the arts. And um, 
Jay and I were thrown together a lot because the schools were right across the street from each other. And our students, Jay Parsons were boys, mine and uh, were girls, wanted needed chaperones. So we went on a lot of trips into the countryside with our students to the um, imperial tombs um, or to the sea. And we that way we really got to know the students really well. Um, as the year wore on, some of my students took me to Buddhist temples. And at that point I learned that there was both Hinayana, the Northern sect and Mahayana Buddhism in Hue um, and in Vietnam and that the Roman Catholics, many of them had come down, fled communism and had come down, but that the majority religion was, was Buddhist. Um, in April of 1963, I took my vacation in Japan and when I returned to Saigon, I discovered I could not get up the way because of student uh, unrest. Um, and then when I did get up to Hue, I learned that this was all due to the uh, celebration of Gautama Buddha's birthday, May 8th. And at this particular celebration in 1963, Buddhists were banned from flying their, their Buddhist flags. Um, and that this, I learned later that this policy was probably brought about by noting to Ziem's brother who had recently been appointed the Archbishop of Hue. Um, in June, martial law was declared, schools were closed, and we learned some of our teachers and students were in jail or prison. So we knew we were to remain neutral, but because it involved many of our students and teachers, it was hard to be neutral. That spring, Jay, in the spring of 1963, Jay and I started a radio program with 15 minutes of English conversation and 15 minutes of American music, jazz, blues, popular music. And we were allowed to continue that. What we learned later from our teachers and students was that they blared that music to them and our English conversation while they were in prison. And they said it was heartening to them to hear it. Um, so uh, June 11, Thich Quang Duc was the first monk to burn himself to death in Saigon in protest. As the protest continued in Hue, some of my friends asked me if I would be willing to help them get information out of Vietnam. And I gave a lot of thought to that and decided I would do so because I felt the world needed to know what was going on. But I told them it would be best if it were put in an envelope so that, and that they didn't tell me what it was. So I was a courier for information twice that one time during the day when i was able to ride my bike over to the consulate and without any problem but then one one time i think there was a delegation from the united nations in saigon and they desperately wanted information to get to that delegation so they brought it to me close to evening and I hesitated because I thought then the military were imposing martial law and I could be shot, but I decided to do it anyway. So I put 
on my backpack and got on my bicycle and rode the few blocks to the consulate and delivered this package to John Helbley. And fortunately, um, uh, he offered me a ride back home with, in a military vehicle. So that's, that's really, in Vietnam, that was really my involvement and kind of my evolution from being neutral and just an observer and trying to absorb and understand the country to becoming more aware of the problems that existed there. And I, I will say that Jay wrote a letter of resignation to Don Luce, who sent him on vacation and asked him to think about it, which he did. And then he came back and continued his, his uh, tour. But he also wrote a letter to the ambassador, I think it was Lodge, and also President Kennedy protesting the war. So he was more vocal than I was. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Uh, Earl Martin, our next speaker, um, was with the Mennonite Central Committee in two tours from 1966 to 1969, and then from 1973 to 1975. He and his wife, Pat, sought to aid displaced farmers in camps and later responded to the problem of unexploited ordnance in the field. Earl was one of the four Mennonite Central Committee workers who chose to stay when the U.S. evacuated from Vietnam. Earl's book, Reaching the Other Side, is a journal of his experience in the final months of the Vietnam War and his experience in the transition as the Americans fled and the North Vietnamese Army took over. Earl. Well, thank you, <clears throat> and greetings to you all. Um, happy to review some of these memories. Uh, in early 1966, just as the U.S. was escalating its military presence in Vietnam, uh, I volunteered with the Mennonite Central Committee to go to Vietnam as a conscientious objector to see if there would be some way we could assist the victims of that war. I got there, uh, studied Vietnamese language for a few months, and then was sent up to central Vietnam uh, to the province of Quang Ai, uh, where the war had been particularly intense in an area where the French never quite had a real foothold during the colonial period. Uh, revolutionary spirit pretty strong in in the area, and that meant there was a lot of warfare. Uh, every night, uh, we would hear the 105 and 10, 155 millimeter howitzers firing out into the countryside um, uh, in what they called H&I fire, harassment and interdiction. Um, daily, we would see phantom jets uh, flying over the countryside or see the helicopter gunships uh, firing down into the villages. Uh, life in the countryside became less and less tenable for people. Some of their own volition, because of the warfare, came in close to the cities where we lived and lived in camps. And there we met them, heard their stories, found ways that we could uh, try to ameliorate their situation. Um, but many stayed in the countryside, living underground often, even cooking underground. Uh, but they discovered if their, the smoke from their fires came out the smoke hole, uh, they would be shelled or a uh, rocket uh, from one of the ubiquitous uh, uh, reconnaissance planes flying over. So it became very, very hard for people to live there. Uh, they learned to pipe the smoke away a hundred yards. So if it got bombed, they were still safe. These are the stories we heard from the people 
as we sought to work with them in vocational training and teaching of English and just getting to know the people, uh, much food distribution. Mennonites had about 40 uh, volunteers in the country uh, at that time, many medical people and social workers and so forth. Uh, toward the end of the war, uh, my wife and I went back for a second term uh, in 1973 to 75, this time focused on, on the problem of unexploded munitions, uh, because after uh, the war, there were lots of these small unexploded grenades, particularly this, this uh, one, uh, an M79 grenade uh, was fired prolifically by the American forces uh, out from outposts and into the countryside uh, to try to, to protect their, their area. And as the farmers went back to their uh, farms to plow, to grow rice again, they would plow with these hoes and slam the hoe into the ground. But one farmer I talked to, Mr. Tan, uh, knew that it would be very dangerous uh, to do that. So he got down on his hands and knees and combed through the grasses. And in a small field about the size of a basketball court, he found 12 of these duds about 15% of these great uh, grenades that were fired 400 meters uh, when they hit did not explode. So they were lying there as duds uh, waiting for the farmer to plow or to uh, hoe. And then only after finding 12 of these grenades and dropping them into an old abandoned well, Mr. Tan said he took up his hoe and started hoeing his field. And unfortunately, there was a 13th grenade there that he hadn't found. His hoe struck the grenade. He was thrown on his back, the hoe way over his shoulder. And, but apparently the hoe hit the near side of the grenade. So it shielded him from the shrapnel and Mr. Tan survived to tell the story. But it was that kind of work that then we tried to do, bringing in armored tractors, both in Vietnam and Laos, to try to clean up some of those munitions. Thank you, Earl. Uh, our next speaker will be Bill Herod. Bill also served two terms in Vietnam with Church World Service and Vietnam Christian Service, the first from 1966 to 68, and then from 1969 to 71 in Pleiku, Tamki, and Saigon. And after the war, uh, Bill worked in education and reconciliation projects, contributing to reconciliation between the US and Vietnam. Bill, I should also mention, Bill was a roommate for some months in Tamki back in 67, probably, 68. You're muted, Bill. Bill, you're muted. There we go. There you go. Yeah, uh, Doug and I uh, lived and worked in Donkey, which was not too far from where Earl worked, although it wasn't, uh, we couldn't go back and forth. These were uh, very dangerous uh, roads. So uh, once we got into Tomkey, we tended to stay there. But uh, we had a wonderful uh, experience under very difficult circumstances. Um, let me say that I worked with uh, Vietnam Christian Service, as uh, did uh, Earl and Doug. Uh, VNCS was a joint uh, program of Church World Service, uh, the Mennonite Central Committee, and Lutheran World Relief. And uh, I would uh, say that the Mennonites played a major role, uh, and we stood on the shoulders of Mennonite giants. Uh, the Mennonites had been working in uh, Vietnam for I think 10 years or so. And uh, they knew the area well and uh, were great uh, guides for us as we learned the ropes. Um, and that's one of the thing I wanted to stress is that we had excellent uh, training in language and culture. Um, and that 
at the time it seemed a little boring and it may not sound very important, but the American soldiers who were all around us did not have that kind of training and it cost lives. I remember, for example, in uh, learning about uh, Vietnamese culture, we learned to show respect, respect to women, to monks, to the elderly. Um, and this uh, helped a lot in the work we did, working in refugee camps and so forth. We would always, when we were meeting with a group of people, we would look around and find the oldest woman <laughs> and we would bow and show respect. And that helped us earn our way in. Um, one thing we learned was uh, that this gesture which we can take to mean hello or goodbye or something. That's a sign that Vietnamese use to call. It's a kind of a brusque sign that means come here to a child or somebody in the street, come here. American GIs didn't know that. And um, so when they would uh, be concerned about uh, Vietnamese approaching them, they would say, go away, go away, go away in English. And the Vietnamese would, of course, think that they were being ordered by armed men to approach. And they did and were shot. I've heard that story many times. Um, so in Tan Ki, we were working in uh, community development, relief and development. Uh, that was the goal. But because of the circumstances of the war, a great deal of it was emergency relief. But when Doug and I got there, the first thing we did was to go around and ask the refugees who were women and children, able-bodied men were gone. So women and children and some crippled people. We asked them what they wanted, what they needed. And Doug and I thought they would need food or seeds or clothing or something. And um, all of them said they needed white cloth. Well, Doug and I, well, when we got back together and compared notes, we thought the white cloth maybe was for school uniforms or shirts or something. So we uh, asked about it and uh, the refugees told us they needed white cloth to bury their dead with decency. These people were hopeless. They're, they're their land was occupied by a foreign occupation force. They referred to it as the American War. This was not the Vietnamese War. This was the American War. Um, and uh, we learned from um, people we lived with. I mean, we shared a room with Vietnamese high school students and um, they came from the countryside. And after a while we learned what that meant. There were several battles in the uh, in the town while we were there, and after the first one, we asked these students if they could help us uh, make contact with the other side because we wanted the revolutionary forces in the area to know who we were and what we were doing. And they all laughed and said, you've met the other side. And we said, when? And they said, frequently. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Our next uh, speaker will be John Balaban. Uh, John was a conscientious objector who volunteered to teach at Kenta University with the International Voluntary Services from 1967 to 1968 and served as the field representative with the Committee of Responsibility from uh, 1968 to 1970, evacuating and returning war injured children to and from the United States. John is the author of 13 books of poetry and, po and prose, including four volumes, which together won the Academy of American Poets Lamont Prize, a National Poetry Series selection, and two nominations for the National Book Award. John. Thank you. I was at, in graduate school at Harvard in 1967, uh, studying old, in Middle English. I had absolutely no intention of having anything to do with the Vietnam War. 
and then Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, came to campus. And as I was coming out of the library, I saw a huge crowd, which had trapped him in his limousine, uh, from which he came out, got up on top of it with the help of Secret Service agents, and then insulted the crowd. He had refused to talk about the war at all, and his treatment of the crowd just infuriated me. And I stewed about that for a week or so. And I wrote to my draft board back in Pennsylvania and said I wanted to declare myself a conscientious objector to the war, and I wanted to go to Vietnam. Uh, and that's how I got into the International Voluntary Services and was teaching at the university in Kentucky. It didn't last very long. Uh, the university was hardly open because of the political strife between the Vietnamese rivals for their presidency in the South. And then the Tet Offensive came and uh, I got wounded by a snip of shrapnel, uh, was able to get an, a flight back from the airport, at, which, was, which was under siege probably on a CIA aircraft and uh, got to Saigon and then finally got home. Uh, but I still had my two years of obligation as a conscience objector to fulfill. So I went to work for a group that treated war injured children. It seemed to me far more to the point of being in Vietnam as an American than I had anticipated. And uh, we, the committee was a group of really stupendous doctors of international fame, mostly out of Harvard Medical School. And uh, they raised a good deal of money and we brought the most severely injured uh, Vietnamese children. Our charter was specifically for children under the age of 18 uh, to hospitals in the United States thinking that their presence in those hospitals would reach out to the communities around those hospitals. And in fact, it did. I think we were moderately successful doing that. And uh, I continued working with the committee as my colleague who's going to join us, Dick Berliner, uh, did as well. Uh, so I worked with war injured children, bringing them to US Air Force planes that took them to the US, um, helped them find foster homes while they were being rehabilitated and then uh, return them in many cases, uh, some not, uh, to, ha to their families in Vietnam. Uh, Dick can tell you more about this as well. I went on to do other things, but I'll talk about that a bit later. Uh, thank you, John. Um, our last speaker in this segment is Claudia Critch. Um, Claudia and her husband, Keith Breton, were co-directors of the American Friends Service Committee Humanitarian Program in Vietnam from March 1973 to July 1975. Keith had also been part of the program there from 1966 to 1970. Their work included running a large civilian physical rehabilitation center in Quang Ai in central Vietnam, researching and reporting the war and wartime culture in Vietnam and hosting visiting uh, dignitaries and delegations. Um, um, Claudia is one of the Quakers who chose to stay as the Americans left at the liberation of, of Saigon. And her new book, Those Who Stayed, A Vietnam Diary, will be published by the University of Virginia Press in March of next year. Claudia. Thanks, Deb. Actually, I I was not raised Quaker, but I attended a lot of Quaker events growing up. Uh, the American Friends Service Committee does works for peace and nonviolence uh, in this country and around the world. They have seminars, work camps, relief programs, and of course, I went to the one in Vietnam. The a little background on AFSC I, right now. The AFSC program in Vietnam began in late 1966 with a daycare center. And soon after that, a large civilian rehabilitation center. Uh, we did not have 
any guns, any arms, and neither did, we wouldn't allow them in. We did, we did not treat soldiers because there were quite a number of uh, military rehab centers in the country, but not civilian. And of course, once a person loses a leg or an arm, especially children, they need new ones uh, as they grow. Um, Earl, I got a kick out of your uh, grenade because one time when we were taking a patient home, uh, me and the social worker, a grenade exploded about 15 feet in front of us. And he said that was an M79 grenade and we could look in, over in the mountains and see where it had come from. But I've never actually seen one. So mm -hmm. that was uh, interesting. Thank you. We were Earl and Pat's neighbors uh, in Kwang Ai. Um, when I got there in 73, the Paris Peace Accords had been signed. So I knew there was no war. It was over. Except it wasn't. The American soldiers were gone, but the bombing continued, the fighting continued. Nothing about it was over until, of course, 1975. Um, our program was, as I say, based in Kwang Ai. We also had two people in Saigon. At its height, we had, I believe it was 18 foreign participants, volunteers. And just like the rest of the people on this panel, uh, we also learned Vietnamese and could speak to and work easily in with people who only spoke Vietnamese. And also, which has already been said, we really had we really didn't know who was on which side, and it didn't matter. Uh, we treated all civilians on all sides of the conflict. In um, when Earl stayed in. March of 1975 in Kwangai, uh, our small group of five left. I wanna mention that we had six in our group and Rick Thompson died in a plane crash in 1973 on uh, Air America. We tried to fly on Air America and not the CIA airline. And uh, Rick was there not, he, he wasn't a conscientious objector because he had returned his draft card to the draft board in protest and then came to Vietnam. And I know a number of other people had done that too. We women um, came for various reasons. As for me, as I said, I thought the war was over. Anyway, we uh, went to Saigon and decided as the as Quang Ai changed hands and other provinces changed hands that we were going to stay and witness what was going to happen next. And a handful of us stayed. Um, I think, I think, well, the Mennonites, the Quakers, and the Shushine, Shushine boys, hmm. and a few other people stayed, plus a whole lot of other foreigners, French people, Indian people, Japanese people, and uh, we were very lucky. We had always wanted to turn our program over to the Vietnamese, because that's how AFSC works. They create a program that is hopefully useful, and then they turn it over to be run by local staff. We couldn't do that. The local government didn't want to run it and were too corrupt to have run it successfully. However, after the war ended, the new government immediately did take it over and the program continues to this day in Queen Yun province. Um, when we got back from Vietnam, the war was over. We were just really lucky that way compared to all the other volunteers. And we went on a, a short speaking tour I think for me, the biggest surprise was all the South Vietnamese flags and, and Vietnamese restaurants that had popped up in the uh, previous two years. So um, don't know if that's the end of my time, but I, oh, I'll, I'll add one more that's kind of funny and everybody else experienced this too. When we would walk on the streets being non-Vietnamese looking in the previous times, people would say, oh, American woman, American woman, American woman, and touch us or just surround us or laugh at us. Well, after the change, it was Russian woman, Russian woman, <coughs> woman. So I'll leave it there, thanks. Thank you, Claudia. Um, for our next round, we're going to uh, kind of look at what we did with the information that we got from uh, our experience in Vietnam and how it was used uh, back in the anti-war movement. 
speaking personally, I know that many American GIs, when they came back from Vietnam, they fell apart partly from uh, moral guilt, partly from PTSD, partly from uh, survivor's guilt. Um, those of us who were there in the humanitarian programs, we were largely shielded from the, the moral guilt that many of the GIs came back, knowing that you know many of the Vietnamese on both sides hated them uh, and that they ended up doing things that uh, they had never imagined they would do. We were privileged to be involved in programs that were actually appreciated um, by the people that we worked with um, and were loved by, by many Vietnamese. But we still came back with some PTSD and some survivor's guilt. I remember how guilty I felt when I came back from Vietnam, knowing that I had served three years in Vietnam and I could come back and go to graduate school. None of the Vietnamese that I'd worked with in the, land, in the previous three years had that option. They all had to stay. And so in many ways, the peace movement for me was my therapy. I came back um, because I felt guilty about surviving, but I knew that if I threw myself in the anti-war movement, there was a possibility that the war would end quicker and I could save the lives of my Vietnamese friends and American colleagues who were still there. So many of the, each of you should now share some of your own experience about what you did when you came back. We'll start with Ann Wright Parsons again, and um, you have about four minutes to tell us about your work when you came back. From 1964 through 1967, I worked in the IVS Washington DC office. And most of the that time, A.Z. Gardner was the executive director. He had a very good uh, style of management. I mean, he was an older man in his late 60s and had been in executive positions his entire career. Um, he brought us all together in his office at the beginning of the week and set up an agenda, got our agreement. And then if there were some difficult issues, he would bring us in again and we would participate with him in a discussion of what we felt should, how the, how the situation should be handled. Well, as, as time wore on, one, one thing IVS provided every volunteer was the opportunity to write a letter every month to 50 to 75 people, friends and relatives in the United States. So each volunteer provided IVS Washington with the list of the people they wanted their newsletter to go to. We, uh, I was responsible for reading through uh, what they wrote before that was typed up and then published. And more and more as the war was beginning to increase, volunteers were writing of their observations of what they saw happening. And particularly in Laos, I remember one a volunteer was riding in a helicopter and they had captured a Viet Cong. And instead of taking him to uh, the camp uh, for the, the prisoners, he was shoved out of the airplane. Well, so that became one of, of many of the uh, of the discussions with AZ Gardner, I said I thought we had a moral obligation to report what people said they saw. And I knew and we all knew 
that this was going to affect the war. These newsletters were very graphic in their details of what was happening in all the rural areas of Laos and Vietnam. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say is that uh, IVS decided to send delegates for teach-ins, which were beginning to happen on university campuses to talk about the war. And I attended one in Cornell and Boston and Washington, D.C. But I became discouraged because what I saw in Vietnam was that a lot of what was going on was a civil war. We shouldn't have been involved. I felt that our country was justifying further and further engagement in a lie, the lie of the domino theory that if Vietnam fell, all of Southeast Asia would fall. And what we knew from Hue was that the Vietnamese hated the Chinese and <laughs> that this would not happen. This was not what was going to go on. And so I, as as the time wore on, I became discouraged with these teach-ins because I it seemed as if no one was listening to anyone, one side or the other. Um, any, anyway, then uh, A.Z. Gardner, because these newsletters were so inflammatory, he was brought of course, back to AIG to justify what we had decided. And he supported the decisions that were made, but it was very difficult for him working with AID. Then I just wanted to say, I had a younger brother who was writing news articles for the newsletter, Curtis, uh, our newspaper, in our hometown criticizing the war. So he was drafted out of graduate school and sent to Vietnam. And fortunately, we had some contacts there so that we had him talk with some of our friends. So he had a sense of who the people really were because in the military, he found that there was just no understanding of the Vietnamese. They were just slopes, you know, who wore these conical hats. Um, and that helped him. He, he was, had gone to Haverford and he was a conscientious objector, but his draft board wouldn't accept that. And so he refused to carry a gun and did work during his time that did not involve the use of a gun. Then my parents helped refu with refugees and uh, our whole family got involved. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Um, Earl Martin. <clears throat> As Doug was saying, uh, after three or in our case, five years in Vietnam, and seeing the war every day, uh, when we were back here in the U.S., we could not keep ourselves from being very active in the anti-war movement. We spoke at teach-ins in uh, on the West Coast where we were in school. We traveled across the U.S. showing uh, Felix Green's inside North Vietnam um, every evening to church and community groups. Uh, we uh, went back to Vietnam, as I said, in 73 to 75 and cultivated relationships with journalists there. Uh, Dave Shipler of the New York Times was one of those journalists who uh, took some of the introductions we made to write a four-part series in the New York Times uh, uh, about political prisoners. Uh, when a uh, congressional delegation 
uh, came to Saigon in early 1975 to discern whether the U.S. should continue funding uh, the Saigon government. Uh, we were there to meet them uh, together with Gene Stalsus, a former IVSer, um, introducing them to political prisoners, to third force people, uh, uh, civil rights activists, and so forth uh, outside of the uh, embassy's um, uh, portfolio. Um, uh, a Mennonite activist, uh, uh, Vincent Harding, uh, was actually the person who drafted much of Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech on Vietnam in 1968, Riverside Church. Um, sometimes we wondered if, if all this activity had any effect. Um, uh, you know, the articles, uh, I worked with the Indochina Resource Center for a while. Uh, but some of you have heard about the testimony of Ambassador Graham Martin, uh, the last amb American ambassador in Vietnam. And when he gave testimony to the House, uh, subcommittee um, in uh, early 1976, um, he said that uh, the the collapse of the government did not come because of anything of the, the U.S. or the Saigon government did. It was because of the propaganda and the uh, progressive uh, organizations like Indochina Resource Center and Don Luce and yeah. Uh, uh, of course, that's ridiculous. Um, the real reason was because of the resistance of the Vietnamese people. But uh, apparently, there, it was a thorn in the side, at least, of the administration. Thank you, Earl. Um, Bill Herod. Yes, uh, I had a similar experience uh, as uh, Earl traveling around the U.S., uh, between tours, I was there from 66 to 68, and then a year and a half from 68 to 69, I traveled around the U.S. a lot, speaking to local civic organizations, campus groups, churches, and uh, so forth, and did a lot of radio and TV interviews about the situation in uh, Vietnam. And then after, I was also in Vietnam at the end of the war in 75. Uh, left uh, just a few days before the change in governments and um, then was uh, in a situation where I was assigned to Hong Kong to reestablish connections with Vietnam, which I did, and uh, was able to return to uh, Vietnam in 1977 um, to um, reestablish uh, church connections uh, with uh, the Vietnamese and uh, went again in 79 and then twice a year during the 80s visited Vietnam and Cambodia uh, reestablishing connections um, and those visits uh, I was based in Washington DC those visits gave me the opportunity to work with congressional offices of the U.S. Congress uh, particularly um, the senators and Congress persons who were interested in normalization of relations with Vietnam. So I did a lot of work with the offices of uh, John Kerry, Bob Kerry, John McCain, uh, Patrick Leahy, uh, and others, um, and helped them arrange visits uh, to Vietnam and took some of their uh, congressional aides to Vietnam and Cambodia during the 80s. Um, we also uh, then hosted uh, Vietnamese visitors coming from Vietnam to the States, uh, such as Le Cao Dai, uh, Cambodia, uh, Vietnam's uh, expert on Agent Orange, and uh, Do Son Nguyen, and others. Um, so we were in position to have some uh, influence and impact uh, as uh, normalization was uh, on track. And that was a great uh, privilege to be involved. 
Another thing that we did with those congressional connections was arrange for licenses for humanitarian aid from the U.S. to Vietnam and Cambodia because of the trade embargo. We had to get licenses for every single item and uh, spent a lot of time working on that. Gave testimony before congressional committees on uh, U.S. policy to post-war Vietnam and Cambodia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bill. Um, John Balbet. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So what did I do when I came back? Like the others on this panel, I spoke about the war. Um, but also I began teaching uh, at Penn State University as an instructor and then had some success with my publications and uh, got serious about teaching. Um, one thing I did do uh, that I'm pleased with, and I have a picture of it here, is I gave testimony on civilian casualties who, who were numbered far greater than casualties on the military of either side, 100,000 civilians per year registered by the Vietnamese Ministry of Health in the South alone were being killed. Uh, and so I had statistics on some very specific cases of children that we had brought to the United States. And I gave uh, a presentation to the subcommittee of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, I guess Edward Kennedy was the chairman of that. But as a teacher, uh, I kept Vietnam pretty much out of my classroom. I can't explain that, but because a year or so after I started teaching in 1970, I applied for a grant to return to Vietnam. I was a younger humanist fellow. And my task was to take a tape recorder and travel the countryside and go up to farmers and fishermen and women at their sewing machines by the river and say, would you sing me your favorite song or poem? And I collected, oh, maybe 5,000 in one year, traveling uh, up and down South Vietnam where it's still safe to go. Uh, and then I got interested because of that, uh, aspect of an oral literature that nobody knew about and for the most part wasn't even written down in Vietnamese and I produced a, a, a collection of uh, maybe 50 of those poems in English and in Vietnamese. Some of them are available on tape. Uh, the other thing that I did that, that I'm particularly pleased that I was able to do was I started a foundation with the two Vietnamese linguist friends called the Vietnamese Nam Preservation Foundation because of, the Vietnamese had a script that was not Chinese, but Chinese looking to us. And it existed for about a thousand years until the French essentially closed it down. Uh, and I started translating one of the most interesting figures in that tradition, a woman who is as naughty as can be in a very male society and how she survived, I'm not quite sure. Uh, but that was Ho Swan Hung, and I translated a book of her poetry. Uh, and those two things preoccupied me in, ever since the end of the war. And I started a foundation with my two friends to preserve that old script, which we ran for 15, no longer 20 years. And then finally it got its own speed after the war ended and Vietnamese scholars all over the world from Vietnam and in Europe uh, poured their efforts into it. And that's a very ongoing thing that I'm pleased to have helped with. Thank you, John. Uh, Claudia? Okay, um, of course, uh, I was in a unique position because when we came back, the war was actually over. Uh, while we were in Saigon before the end of the war, which was not called Saigon at that point, of course, the, well, it was, the bloodbath stories 
the threats, the fear, the propaganda that the US government and the South Vietnamese government disseminated broadly that helped fuel the uh, panic and evacuation of people leaving Vietnam. Well, that ended up being the memory that we encountered when we came back to America. The other major thing that I encountered coming back was disinterest. It was over, who cares? It just wasn't, it wasn't on people's minds. Uh, AFSC sent us on a several month long speaking tour around the country. And I remember one particular place, I don't remember where we were, maybe in Iowa, where there was exactly one person who came to hear us speak. They're just, it was, it was over. The, um, after our speaking tour, a couple of months after that, I worked with uh, John in John McAuliffe in the AFSC Philly office. And uh, over the years, well, actually, one of the things we did when we came back was we were interviewed by a variety of sources. One of them was Ms. Magazine. And uh, parts of my journal that I had kept while we were in Saigon, and which then changed to uh, Ho Chi Minh City, they published some of that in their magazine, for which I was very grateful. Uh, recently, when we realized that people still don't really understand what happened in Vietnam, uh, I, this is what prompted me to help turn my journal into a book and get help from other sources, some of whom are on this screen. We, um, let's see, I wanna mention two things. I spoke at one point to a public PBS, public broadcasting system, state, uh, local station. I went to their, to a meeting and I just told the truth, told what we had, had happened. And this drew wrath and indignation from some of the people there. I remember one in particular was some sort of a high ranking officer who had fled as a, a boat person and he was positive he was right, even though I was there and he was not, but how could, how could I possibly be right? Because it ruined all their thinking about why they had left the country in those early days. I won't even get into more recent reasons people have left the country. In um, 2016, I joined uh, a five-year POW, Bob Chenoweth and Jane Griffith Barton, my predecessor, and um, Diane Jones, who was on the AFSC team, we had the privilege of attending a very moving event. Uh, it was the 45th anniversary, I think, of the release of POWs. And in the, in the presentation were both POWs. There was a picture of John McCain, he wasn't there, and their guards and their captors. So they were trying to teach their younger generation about the war and how useless and horrible and meaningless it was. And I just wish that that were also being taught to our young people, that war doesn't solve problems. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, we have a special guest, um, Dick Berliner. Uh, it took us a while to track him down. Um, but we did finally find him and he was an IVS uh, volunteer. And after returning from IVS, uh, became involved with dispatch news service that played a very significant role uh, during the Vietnam War. Uh, Thank, you. Thank you, Doug. Uh, as a quote, special guest, I know I have three minutes, <laughs> not 10, but a whole lot. So I've put some bullet points and we'll try and keep within that framework but uh just quickly i've vietnam entered my consciousness in 1963 when the buddhist monk uh emulated himself i was at quaker college earlham college um and then we started doing study groups and vigils and when i went to denmark in 1964 i found people there were more upset about vietnam than we were in the united states so it took a while to catch on but uh I went to Vietnam not as a CO, but as a draft doctor or a draft evader. I was uh, able to get a deferment from the draft because IVS was considered 
critical to the efforts of the United States of America, to the uh, war effort. And uh, I think we underplayed that a little bit. It probably was more true in some ways than others in terms of our work. Uh, but what I want to do is really talk about how people who served in Vietnam really did serve the anti-war movement in a variety of factions. And you've, you've heard anecdotally how that happened, uh, but there was some organization. Uh, first, as volunteers, some volunteers that have been mentioned reached out to press to tell them stories of atrocities um, that, would, that would not get out otherwise. And Gloria Emerson was a good contact for Ron Moreau, Alex Simkin, uh, for the New York Times. Um, uh, well, I forgot his name. <laughs> yeah, we all had contacts in the newspapers and would, would try and feed them information. And the, the biggest example of this was Don Luce when he led uh, the congressional delegation and Look Magazine to the Tiger Cages on Sun Island. And that was a impactful story that also impacted the war. That was after he left Vietnam. Um, we've talked about the role of volunteers in briefing political leaders. Um, groups in the United States would coordinate these efforts. It wasn't haphazard and arranged for us to meet with people like uh, Bert Spy and Governor George Romney and introduce students to them who had a different view of the war. Because when Romney came back and said he was brainwashed, he was talking about what the military tried to do to him. People didn't understand that. Um, but he killed his political career. Uh, Senator Kennedy met with uh, David Gettleson. And Gettleson, who some of you read about in John Balaban's book, uh, known as the poor American because he went everywhere, barefoot, lived remotely, and had a lot of stories to tell and, and shared those with Senator Kennedy. And uh, he was assassinated soon after. And there's still debate on whether it was the Viet Cong or the South Vietnamese government. But uh, check out John Balaban's memoir. Um, some IBSers got involved by coming back to the United States and testifying against the war. Hugh Mankey was one of those. He was promptly kicked out of Vietnam. He was one of the few that was actually forced to leave Vietnam because of the political activities. Um, I guess the most significant thing from IVS point of view was taking direct critical uh, steps that were cri directly critical of the Vietnam War. Uh, the whole leadership of IVS in 67 September resigned to protest the war, Don Luce, and we'd heard uh, Gene Stulse's name and Willie Myers. And then about two or three weeks later, 49 members of IBS signed a letter to the United States uh, to, uh, to President Johnson protesting the U.S. presence. It was a lengthy letter documenting the atrocities and the impact of the U.S. government on Vietnam. And fortunately, uh, A.Z. Gardner, as Anne described, was uh, not retributive. He came to Vietnam and, and visited with individuals and said, your job is not political, and said, do better. But he, we found out later he secretly supported our actions, we think, um, and actually protested the war himself. So there were some direct political actions. And then when people started coming back, as we've heard today, there were a lot of speaking opportunities. One group that was organized was actually funded by the United Methodist Church, the Vietnam Education Project. They put up $100,000 to hire a staff of three or four people who would then coordinate returning volunteers to go out in places like I went to in, in uh, Pocatello, Idaho, or Des Moines, Idaho, where I was interviewed by the Des Moines Register and spoke to Lyons. Clubs and and they sent us out to uh, groups like the National Audubon Society. We looked for who, whoever would listen about the war, but their primary role was flooding Congress with information, making contact with over 150 members of Congress, and lobbying 13 states, particularly in their home states, were critical of the war. Um, and that project. Uh, 
probably went on for about two years, I guess. And I think Willie Myers was going to talk more about that maybe at the next meeting. Um, my particular role in Vietnam, um, serving COR and then serving with dispatch news service. And the one story about COR I'll tell is that we had to get permission from parents to send their kids to the United States for medical treatment. Well, one parent was an NLF soldier in prison in Quang Nai, very close to the, the Mennonite Center there. And I had to go into the prison to get his permission to send his son to a country that he was fighting against for his freedom. And I, the one thing I remember about him was he had very steely but clear eyes as if he knew what his purpose was. And he didn't hesitate to get permission. Dispatch News Service was started in Vietnam, uh, not by volunteers, but by uh, Mike Morrow and others. But it really utilized Vietnamese um, speaking people from IBS uh, to be the source of information. And for three years, uh, IBSers served as freelance reporters and, and also dispatch recruited others. And the biggest story came out of Washington it was the Mila massacre that Seymour Hirsch wrote. And there were other stories like uh, Mike Morrow's story on being captured for three months, for six weeks in Cambodia. But most of the stories were not timely. They were just about the daily lives of Vietnamese and how they're being impacted uh, as refugees, as uh, people brutalized by, uh, by bombings. Um, and it, it did seem to have an impact. And we prided ourselves in that we would get the same story published in the Seattle Times and circulated by Liberation News Service and printed by the, speckled, the Great Speckled Bird, an alternative weekly. So we, we served a mass market. And, uh, you know, if, if information is helpful, then we were helpful in providing that. Um, ultimately, I decided I had to get more political and the fifth way former volunteers served was joining political campaigns. I went to work in the McGovern campaign. Uh, Fred Branthman, who had a huge impact on the information side, went to work for Jerry Brown. The one thing I mentioned, I didn't mention COR, because uh, I want experience, is that COR really depended on volunteers who could speak the language. I don't know that it could have done its job at all without the training that we all had to do that job. And I couldn't have done COR's job without two years working with IBS. So there was a very much a continuum of activity that most of us experienced one way or the other. Thank you very much. Um, John, I think there were a number of other people who were interested in making verbal comments. Do you have any of them lined up? Um, not I will do that now, but there was, this was to be more of a time of discussion among the panel uh, and obviously with Dick. Uh, so I will look at the, uh, I think there's actually just one person who said that he had wanted to say something. Okay. And it, so the floor is open. Um, any of you who want to reflect on any of the other conversations that were started here about uh, how the time and experience that uh, we had in Vietnam uh, was useful in um, in in the anti-war movement and in changing the the uh, mood of the country when we came back. I'd Remind like to Go I'd ahead. like to throw in that. The 50th anniversary of the end of the war is next April. And hopefully everybody on the panel and people in the audience, if they have some opportunity to, uh, I don't know, address politicians, make it relevant. It doesn't have to really be about the war. In, in my opinion, there's plenty of other, there are plenty of other issues that are political that people could be active in. We were activists back then when we were young and it would be nice if people were activists now. I'm sure there are many, but it would that's another important element. 
Yes, well, I know the uh, Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee is in the middle of conversations about how we can best commemorate uh, the April 30th, uh, 50th anniversary of the end of, of that war and what we can learn from it. So uh, there's discussion both with the Vietnamese and also with a variety of um, organizations and universities here in the United States, how we might best do that commemoration. I think one thing that we need to emphasize is the war chemical industry and their use of that situation to learn new technologies. I was involved with uh, data entry when I lived uh, in 1968, we moved to Hawaii and I helped uh, a couple of researchers who were going back and forth to Vietnam and interviewing villagers on the effects of Agent Orange. And this was a National Science Foundation project. Mm -hmm. I was ashamed and horrified at what was being allowed to happen by our government. And I went back in 2018 with Tom Fox's leadership. Uh, he was an IVSer. And we stopped in Hue at a hospital where the doctor was working with third and fourth generation Vietnamese who were still feeling the effects of Agent Orange. It's a very long lasting forever chemical. It's, it's a bunch of chemicals. We never no one has ever done anything about shaming those companies or getting them to pay for some of the damage they did to the Vietnamese and to the IBSers who died because they too were sprayed with Agent Orange while they were there. I wonder, I know there are groups working actively right now about Agent Orange. Oh, yes. And one is Dick Hughes. I can't remember who he's working with. Viet Thanh Nguyen has also been involved in that, and I certainly yeah. a good cause ongoing. There are some IVSers, but it is not a national issue, and no. it should still be a national issue. The yeah. damage that was done from that is just profound and ongoing. I think one thing on is, Agent, I'm sorry, on Agent Orange, uh, Mennonite sent uh, uh, occupational therapists and another so social worker to uh, Quang Ai province, actually, for three years to relate to some of the uh, victim families there and to uh, introduce ways that they could uh, support themselves, as well as doing therapy on some of the second or third generation deformities uh, that were caused by the uh, by the uh, agent orange hey, Doug Doug uh, Bob Minnick and John Nguyen wanted to speak I've tr Bob do you want to go ahead about three minutes sure three minutes it's good uh, can you hear me yeah sure. yes. um, uh, Don Luce Gene Stosos and I spent some time at Cornell putting together the Indochina Mobile Education Project. And we travel around to four or five states and stopped in shopping centers and churches and other places. And we uh, talked about the war. Uh, Gene Stolzer set up the uh, contacts with the press and we talked to people who came through the exhibit, and Don Luce talked to um, many people in the press about what we're doing. So we got a lot of exposure, and it's really great. Um, and then part of my 
out of that experience, I applied for a position as an asylum officer with the US government. So this doesn't have so much to do about Vietnam, but it has to do with my, my exposure to refugees when I was in Vietnam. And because of that experience, plus my Vietnamese, uh, not fluency, but ability, conversational Vietnamese, uh, they hired me uh, just because I could speak another language. And so uh, out of IBS and my experience in Vietnam, I feel so blessed. And the anti-war work plus what it got me into beyond that is talking to people from countries all over the world who are seeking asylum. When asylum was really good in this country, when we were providing asylum for all the other countries together, we were providing more asylum than, than they were. And of course that's changed now and it's really in trouble right now. But because of my obvious experience, that's what happened. Thanks, Bob. And you've previewed our next webinar in a month, which will be about the Mobile Education Project. Mm -hmm. uh, so John Nguyen, I think you're unmuted. You have about three minutes to say something. Oh, yeah. Thank you, sir. Do you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, I'm so moved. I don't know what to say, but a lot of things to say. I am so happy to learn about the webinars. And in fact, uh, I was expecting to see you, John McAuliffe, again, Del Jose, Bill Harrod, Earl Martin, those people I met in Vietnam and those I haven't met, but I read about a lot, John Balaban and Wright and Claudia Kutch. So allow me to introduce myself and share a bit about my journey uh, within three minutes, is okay? Within three Although, minutes, yes. Okay. Um, from 1966 to 1974 in Tam Ki, Vietnam, I dedicated my time to social work alongside remarkable VNCS social workers from the United States, uh, including Mr. Doug Hosseter, Mr. Bill Hurst, and Mr. Morris Byrne, as well as Hiro Ichikawa from Japan. During this period, I was involved in selling bamboo crabs with Mr. Dirk Hosseter at the Chulai Air, Air Base near Tamki. I also taught primary school children in refugee areas in and around Tamki. Much of the work took place during summers as I was concurrently pursuing my study at Way University. After graduating, I continued my social work while teaching at high school in Tamki. In early 2029, I resettled in the United States under the humanitarian resettlement program. Since then, I have had the privilege of teaching ESL, TISO, Vietnamese language and culture at various esteemed institutions, including University in Vietnam in Da Nang, Way. Ho Chi Minh City, Hanoi, and in the U.S., University of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, American University, D.C., Kansas State, L.A., University of Texas in Austin, American National University in Virginia, University of the Potomac in D.C., and FSI of the U.S. Department of State and DLI of Department of Defense and more. I have authored several publications on the subject, and with my most recent work being a memoir reflecting on 55 years of study English, culture, and higher education in both Vietnam and the United States. This memoir holds special place in my heart as it pays tribute to the American friends who guided and taught me so much about the English language and American culture and society during those informative years in Tam Ki, Vietnam, almost five to six decades ago. Okay, thank, thanks very much, John. We yes. need to take some of the questions before we close down in about five okay. minutes, so thank you. Um, we have a question 
uh, about whether any of you have returned to Vietnam after your service there, and if so, what was your impression? It's from Gary Studebaker. There was a earlier question of more generally about given where the relationship is now between the U.S. and Vietnam, what sense do you make of what was happening 50 I'll years ago? I'll just say ago. quickly that I've been back four times. First time in the year 2000, 25 years after. And uh, Vietnam is changing rapidly. When you travel for two weeks, you really see one side of what's happening. Everybody's upbeat. It's glamorous. It's glittery. Beautiful. Food's great. Um, you sense that there's caution about not talking sp too specifically about the government or about politics. There's still retribution of people who work for Americans. Uh, two generations later, they still can't get jobs. There was a tremendous amount of hardship and starvation. So it's kind of a mixed picture, but it definitely is a nice place to visit. And I support that. But after working the last four years on a memoir, I've gotten so deeply in the trenches that uh, I wake up speaking Vietnamese these days. But it's a great place to go back to. Um, Ed Fox asked if anyone was in touch with Lely Hayslip, who's continuing her own project with Vietnam. Claudia, are you? Well, so so are you. I, everybody on that list. Is. <laughs> right. That's it. I don't know any more than what she has said okay. out to, the, All right. to, the, yeah. to you and other people. And somebody asked whether you knew Lady Borton. And if you could say something about her work in Vietnam. Lady was incidentally invited to be on this program, but her overwork prevented her from doing that. Are you asking anybody? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the question was to you. So in the Oh. Well, she was, I don't remember what years. She was uh on the AFSC team before I got there. And my husband was on it with her and she's been, she's written books, she's been active and she's lived there for a very long time. We met, uh, my wife and I went back to Vietnam the last time, uh, 2018 for 50th wedding anniversary uh, in Quang Ai. Uh, and we traveled on to Hanoi where we spent some time with Lady. Uh, she was very much involved and very deeply appreciated um, by the uh, the people that she's working with there. Uh, she has a phenomenal um, understanding of Vietnam. Her books are compelling. Um, yeah, she's a very busy and uh, valued woman. Anybody else want to respond to the going back? And your impressions once you... Uh, John, I uh, went back many times, um, as I said, twice a year during the 80s and into the 90s, so more than 20 times. And uh, there were substantial differences uh, from the early years to the later years. Uh, in, the, in the first visit in 77 and 79, things were pretty tight, pretty difficult. Uh, but uh, as time went on, um, it opened up. I was able to visit uh, with friends uh, that I'd known before. In the early years, it was uh, sort of secret uh, meetings, but later it was quite open, and um, I was quite welcome and able to wander around on my own. I haven't been back since uh, 1992, but look forward to going back sometime. We're encouraging people to go back for the 50th anniversary. Uh, if they can do that for D-Day, we can do it for Vietnam. So. <laughs> and I would say, as somebody who's made many, many trips back, that the transformation of Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia, you have to actually see, you believe, and comprehend what it is meant for people's lives. And as, as I say, there was a question of what it all meant. I mean, the horror show of what happened from 
after the OSS left Vietnam and then our support for the French and then going back in militarily to the end in 75, none of that was necessary. And there were 3 million people killed in the course of it. Marta Daniels, John, has a question for you. Can you see that or do you want me to read it? You're muted. The question for me? No, for John Balaban. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, there are three Johns here. Yeah, <laughs> right. What's the question? Her question was whether you could comment on the American impact the Committee of Responsibility children had on local communities when they appeared in the U.S. for reconstructive surgery, for example, for napalm burns, and how their presence here really stirred powerful emotions over what the U.S. was doing in Vietnam. Also, please comment on the reaction of the U.S. government who began slow walking or stopping Committee of Responsibility from bringing more children to the states after a very short period of time once they realized their impact. Well, the last part of that sentence is the answer to it. I mean, the children, we were in a difficult position. One, we wanted the children to appear in the United States in hospitals. On the other hand, they weren't on dis display. Um, and when the one when the children who were here for longer periods of time were taken in by semi-adoptive families, uh, just their presence in public schools uh, had a huge effect because some of these children were so visibly wounded. Um, there was one three-year-old that I helped bring to the United States who eventually who's who's, who's who was found under the body of her mother in a heap of bodies that had been massacred in a village. So she had nobody to return to. Her father, in fact, had been with the Viet Cong and was killed. Um, she became a very successful US banker. And uh, I remember there was a PBS show about her. And then a few years ago, uh, she went back to her village and was felt totally distant from the place. And, uh, couldn't speak Vietnamese, didn't know anybody there, and, and fled back to the United States. Uh, there are cases like that, and there are cases of children who uh, went back and to Vietnam and led highly successful lives again out in the countryside. So we had a huge impact, it, but to answer the question, the presence of those children uh, in American communities uh, was very troubling to the U.S. government because it was obvious what had happened to them. Most of them were bombed by uh, you know, almost the entire group of, of children that we treated. Almost the entire group of Vietnamese civilians in hospitals were uh, wounded by American armaments dropped in the air for the most part or bombed uh, from artillery shells. So... I'm losing track of the question. You want to give it to me again? No. I, I think you've got the essence of it. You've got okay. it. Thank you. One quick comment on the John's experience. Uh, we had a child named Chow Quinn who was paraplegic. Yeah. She was set to go to the United States. John went down to get her and found out that the American AMA doctor had sent her back to the village. And he said, in so many colorful words, I'm not going to support any blank program that Benjamin Spock is part of. <laughs> Spock, Dr. Spock was on the board of COR. So as we became more visible, there was more resistance. But one of the problems we had is that children were on a standby basis. And after Tet, it took forever to get them places. We thought it was political. But the fact is that more Americans were getting wounded uh, and filling up planes because the U.S. was sending out more patrols after Tet to try and figure out how to take back the country, I think. There are a lot of factors involved, but yeah. I have to commend John on working with the Vietnamese bureaucracy. Um, he did a great job, and we had a lot of support in Washington, too. And people like R.W. Apple wrote good stories in New York Times and, and all that. Well, in that particular case uh, of Chao Quinn, 
Um, she, I made a protest to our organization. The organization was connected to people in Congress. Congress uh, contacted the State Department. Ambassador Ellsworth Bunker personally signed an order reprimanding the Air Force surgeon who sent that child back to paralyzed child back to die in order that he himself readmit her to the hospital in Kentucky and uh, did so. She, was, she Her life was saved eventually. Yeah. It was a complex affair. So we have gone beyond our 90 minutes. Okay. Um, Doug, do you want to, or anybody else have final comments you want to say? Well, I would like to thank everybody for participating in this really stimulating discussion. Um, uh, I know that we are only a small fraction of the Americans that uh, volunteered time in Vietnam uh, during the Vietnam War and came back and used their experience uh, in learning the language, the culture, the art, the literature, uh, and the cuisine uh, to enrich our culture and to help Americans understand the wonderful people uh, of Vietnam that our country tried to destroy. Thank you. Anybody else want a final comment? And let me just again remind you that a month from now, Mobile Education Project, which did a lot of grassroots work that's been referred to, uh, will have a special program about their work. We're looking forward to a program on the uh, history of the coalition to stop funding the war. Um, and as I say, lots of other things as we start preparing for the 50th anniversary. I wanted to say one final thing because somebody commented on it and uh, to make it very contemporaneous. Um, if kids from Gaza were caught, brought to the United States, maybe it would have a very salutary impact on American policy. So uh, find re rebirth the Committee of Responsibility to... Okay, um, thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. Um...